the respiratory system. After completing this section, you should be able to describe the function of the respiratory system, list the structures involved in the respiratory system and their functions, describe the respiratory membrane and how gas is exchanged across it, explain the four steps of respiration, distinguish between inspiration and expiration, list the factors that affect breathing volume and capacity, List and describe respiratory sounds. Describe how the nervous system controls respiration. List and describe non-neural factors that influence respiratory rate and depth. List homeostatic imbalances of respiration and the parts of the respiratory system. Describe the importance of surfactant. And describe developmental disorders of the respiratory system. The function of the respiratory system is pretty straightforward. It is to supply the body with oxygen and to remove carbon dioxide. There are four processes involved in respiration. Ventilation, external respiration, gas transport, and internal respiration. And we'll talk about these a little later. Let's start by looking at the parts of the respiratory system. The nose which has the nostril and the nasal cavity associated with it, the pharynx or the throat region, the larynx or the voice box, the trachea, which branches into the bronchial tubes, and those feed air into the lungs. Now the lungs are composed of microscopic structures, bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveoli. So they themselves are not exactly a structure so much as they are a collection of microscopic structures. Let's talk a little bit about each part and how they function. The nose is the passageway for air. It's how air is designed to get into your body. The nose has, is lined with, the, the nasal passages are lined with a mucous membrane that has a rich capillary supply. This is why if you get hit in the nose, you bleed pretty profusely because there's a big blood supply to that part of the head. As air is brought in through the nostrils and passes across these mucous membranes, it's warmed and it's moistened. The mucus also helps to trap particles that may be in the air, and the nose hairs filter larger particles out, so this also acts to filter and cleanse the air as well as warm and moisten it. There is a bony palate that separates the nasal cavity from the oral cavity, and then behind the bony palate there is some muscular tissue that's called the soft palate. The maxilla form initially as two separate bones and they make most of the hard palate. In some instances the maxilla do not fuse properly and so the palate is not closed. The bony palate is not closed at birth and you have cleft palate. And sometimes this is only on the inside of the mouth and sometimes it's all the way out to the outside. This is typically corrected with surgery fairly soon in life. Uh, people with cleft palate have eating problems because of the inability to have a separate nasal and oral cavity, and they're going to have difficulty with speech until they get the cleft palate repaired. The bones of the skull are hollow in some places. These are the sinuses. The frontal, sphenoid, ethmoid, and maxillary bones have these sinuses called the paranasal sinuses because they're all around the nasal cavity. The sinuses help make the skull a little lighter, and it also serves as resonating chambers for your speech. Now because the mucous membranes of the nose also are continuous with the mucous membranes of the sinuses, when rhinitis or an inflammation of the nasal mucosa develops, it may turn into also sinusitis. Most rhinitis is caused by viruses. However, some irritations of the nasal passages can be as the result of allergens or toxic fumes that you inhale. Any of these can spread along the mucous membrane from the nasal passages into the sinuses. So colds sometimes turn into sinusitis. The pharynx, or the throat, acts as an air passageway when we talk about the respiratory system, but it can also be, parts of it can be a food passageway in the digestive system. The pharynx is divided into three parts. The nasopharynx, which is right here behind the nose, and only air should be in here. 
the oropharynx, which is right here behind the mouth, and then the laryngopharynx, which is this last little bit just before you get to the larynx, which is the next part of the respiratory system. There's a little thing that hangs down here in the back of your throat, and this is called your uvula. Now, food is directed into the oropharynx, and when you swallow, a couple of things happen to make sure that the food does not go up into your nose or down into your trachea, but is directed back here into your esophagus. Also associated with the uh, area is the eustachian tube, or the pharyngotympanic tube. This goes from the pharynx up to the middle ear. Uh, your middle, your eardrum has to have equalized pressure on it and it's kind of collapsed down. When you swallow or uh, hold your nose and blow, you open up the eustachian tube and that allows your eardrums to pop. It also acts as an avenue for infections of the nasopharynx to travel into the middle ear causing otitis media. Now to help protect you from infection, there's some lymphatic tissue that is found here in the naso and oropharynx. These are the tonsils and the adenoids. The adenoids are really a type of tonsil, but they just got a separate name because they tend to be up in here. Because of the way these are structured, they can become houses or homes for bacteria, and when that happens, then you have tonsillitis. Sometimes tonsillitis resolves with medication, antibiotics. Sometimes the tonsils become so much a home for bacteria that it's just better to remove them and you have a tonsillectomy. Okay, the larynx is the voice box. It houses the vocal folds, which vibrate when air pass across them to make sound. Now the epiglottis is one of the cartilage of the larynx, and when you swallow, the epiglottis closes to keep stuff from going down the trachea, and that uvula also is pressed upward so stuff doesn't go up into your nasal passages. It's really kind of neat. Now if you feel in your throat, you can feel the lump. That is your larynx. When you swallow, you feel how it rises up, and when it rises, that's what causes the epiglottis to close. It also forces the uvula back to protect your nasopharynx. The trachea is sometimes known as your windpipe. Now, the windpipe has to be held open at all times. The esophagus of the digestive system is a collapsible tube. The, the volume of food and liquid going through it will open it up so that food and liquid can get to the stomach. But air is not going to be able to open up passages. So the windpipe or the trachea is held open by some cartilage that are C-shaped. They have a little bit of their opening toward the back in the esophagus so that the esophagus has a little give room but can't totally close the trachea. If the trachea becomes damaged, and one of the things that they teach combat killers to do is to crush the larynx because that effectively stops air from moving into the trachea, you have to maintain that airway into the trachea, and they can do a tracheostomy. They want to make sure they do this below the vocal folds so that they don't damage them. Also, food sometimes blocks the uh, trachea, and uh, air then can't move in and out. People who have a totally blocked trachea can't make any sound. So if you've got someone gasping or coughing, yeah, they're having some trouble getting air in and out, but they are not going to necessarily pass out because they're not getting air. People who need the Heimlich maneuver performed on them will be unable to make a sound, which is why they will look like they're having a heart attack because they'll just kind of clunk over as a result of not getting air into their lungs. The Heimlich maneuver or the abdominal thrust is when you take your fist, you come up behind somebody, you take your fist, you put it right under the xiphoid process and you thrust upward, the idea being that you will Dis decrease the um, size of the thoracic cavity and that will force air out and that should dislodge whatever is blocking the trachea. Now here you see the C-shaped cartilage. This is toward the front of your throat and here's the esophagus in the back. So you can see there's a muscle that kind of holds the C-shaped cartilage together and the esophagus, when food is going in, it can kind of bulge in here, but can never totally close this off. 
Now you have mucus cells, mucus secreting cells that are here. These are epithelial cells and they have little cilia on them. This is called the ciliary escalator. While the mucus of the nose traps quite a bit of material that gets into the uh, respiratory system, other material and even bacteria that may kind of trickle down from your mouth can also get trapped in mucus of this tracheal mucus lining. The cilia beat to bring this mucus that contains stuff you don't necessarily want to get to your lungs up to your mouth so that you can get rid of it somehow. We call this the ciliary escalator and this is a very important protective feature against infection. Now this is a scanning electron micrograph of those cilia. Looks kind of like a dust mop, doesn't it? And one of the things that happens when you smoke is these cilia first become paralyzed so they no longer function and eventually they're destroyed. This is why people after they've smoked for a few months have that horrible cough every morning when they get up because the mucus that's become trapped in their trachea while they were sleeping has to be brought up somehow and they have to do it by coughing instead of the neat little ciliary escalator. The trachea is going to branch to the right and left primary bronchi and then the bronchi are going to repeatedly branch into the lungs. Uh, they call this sometimes the bronchial tree because if you think of the trachea as the trunk of a tree, the two big branches and then all the repeated branches, it looks a little bit like an upside down tree if you think about it. The smallest of these air passages are the bronchioles and as we get into the bronchioles we're into some of the microscopic structures of the lung. Let's take a little look at the lungs. The lungs we have a right lung and a left lung and the right lung has three lobes the right upper, right middle, and right lower lobe and you'll see RUL, RML, and RLL as the abbreviations for these and then on the left side you only have two lobes remember the heart is two-thirds to the left side of the body so that takes up a little bit of the space on the left side so you only have a left upper lobe LUL and a left lower lobe LLL. Now because the lungs are in a closed space, this thoracic cavity, it's going to have a serous membrane associated with it and this serous membrane is called the pleura. Like all serous membranes, the pleura lines the chest cavity and then folds back and covers the lungs themselves. So you have a parietal pleura and it actually comes up in here and folds back around this lung and over here it does the same thing it comes around the walls and then folds back around the lung. This leaves a tiny little bit of space between the parietal and the visceral pleura and there's just a tiny bit of pleural fluid, serous fluid, pleural fluid that's secreted that does a couple of things. First it acts as a lubricant so as you inhale and exhale your lungs expanding and, and contracting can move freely against the chest cavity wall. And it also acts to kind of stick these guys together a little bit so that when you make the chest cavity bigger, the lungs kind of go along for the ride. And when you push downward, the lungs are made smaller as well. And this is important in the ventilation process of breathing. Pleurisy is a condition where the pleura becomes inflamed and it does a couple of things. First of all, it makes a sticky fluid in excess and if you get more fluid in that pleural space, it compresses the lungs and so they can't fill completely. The other thing, because it is sticky, the pleura don't move smoothly against each other. So when you inhale and exhale, you have rather painful uh, movement of the lung against the chest cavity. Most people try hard not to breathe very deeply to prevent that pain. Now as I mentioned earlier, the lungs are, are what house the microscopic structures of the lungs and the tiny little air sacs of the lungs are the alveoli. Singular would be alveolus, change the I to US. So you have the tiniest bronchioles they break down into what are called the respiratory bronchioles and each of these feed an alveolar duct and the alveolar duct is going to have all of these little air sacs, these alveoli, attached to it. So these are the air sacs of the lung. 
Now this little yellow network you're seeing are elastic fibers because the alveoli have to inflate and then we need some help deflating them. So it's kind of, they're kind of really like little balloons. You know how you can blow a balloon up and then if you don't hold the air in it, the air comes out and the balloon gets a little smaller. And then you can blow it up again and then it deflates. And that's exactly how the alveoli work. The alveoli are where the gas exchange actually occurs. Now as we look at the respiratory system functionally, we can divide the structures up into two zones. There's the conducting zone, which is the part that cleanses and humidifies and warms the incoming air. In other words, it's basically the uh, HVAC unit. It's what comes in to bring the air in. And then we have the respiratory zone. And the respiratory zone is where the gas exchange actually occurs. And these are the microscopic structures of the lung. So when we look at the conducting zone, the nose, pharynx, larynx, trachea, and bronchi are all really designed to simply get the air in to the lungs and to, you know, condition it along the way. Then the respiratory zone would be all of the microscopic structures of lungs, the tiny bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and the alveoli. These have to be open in, other, in order to get air into a position so gases can be exchanged. The gas exchange occurs across what's called the respiratory membrane. And the respiratory membrane is composed of a single layer of epithelium that makes up the wall of the alveolus. Remember, epithelium always has to sit on a basement membrane or a basal lamina. And in this case, the alveolar epithelium sits on one side of this basement membrane and the capillary epithelium, remember the capillaries again only have that single epithelial cell layer, sits on the other side. So they share both sides of the same basement membrane. This makes for an extremely thin membrane, only two cells thick and a little bit of basement membrane. Gas is going to flow in the alveoli, blood will flow in the capillaries. And gas exchange occurs by simple diffusion. You may remember that oxygen and carbon dioxide are lipid soluble. Anything that's lipid soluble just kind of dissolves through the cell membrane over to the other side. Now here we see the alveoli. These are the single cells of the alveoli. You do have some extra cells in there. The uh, little blue ones here are some phagocytic cells that roam through the uh, alveoli and their little interconnecting ducts between all the alveoli so that they can move from one to the other. So that should anything get into the lungs that shouldn't get there, these guys take them out pretty quickly. And then you have a few cells in the alveolus that secrete something called surfactant. These little tiny air sacs are just like those itty bitty balloons that you can get to make water bombs with. If you've ever tried to blow one of those babies up, it is like hard, hard to do. And the alveolus, when you puff it full of air, because of the elasticity of the alveolus, it will collapse down. If it collapsed down all the way, it would be very hard to open up. Imagine taking one of those balloons and just putting a little bit of water in it so that you blow it up, and when it collapses down, the water, and water has surface tension to it, sort of collapses the sides of the balloon down so that they stick to each other. Now when you try to blow that thing up, it's really extra hard to do because not only do you have to overcome the elasticity of the balloon, but you've also got to overcome that water tension. So while the alveoli are elastic to help push air out of them, they've got this surfactant which keeps the water from pulling too much on anything to keep the alveoli from totally collapsing shut. Here you see how the capillaries all of these red things are capillaries that are running around the alveoli. So that you can see, we have the single cell of the capillary lining. We have the single cell of the alveolus and a very thin basement membrane. And oxygen and carbon dioxide can move freely across those by diffusion. Now as we look at the alveolar ducts and the alveolar sacs, as I mentioned, as I showed you just earlier, all of these little alveoli are connected to each other by pores. 
and they're surrounded by these fine elastic fibers to help them go back down once they've been inflated with air. The pores that connect all of the different alveoli help do two things. One, it, it prevents, if one gets a little bit damaged, we can still get air into it. But the other thing is it allows those dust cells, those phagocytic cells, to crawl all through the alveoli and maintain the sterility of the lung. The lung is considered a sterile tissue. All right, let's see where we are. Air is warmed and humidified in the lungs, the bronchi, the alveoli, or the nose. The nose is where most of that heating and humidification occurs. The alveoli are where gas exchange is going to occur. The lungs are simply collections of the alveoli. And the bronchial tubes, for the most part, are just tubing to get the air into the lungs. Smoking first damages what part of the respiratory system? The respiratory membrane, the eustachian tube, the cilia in the trachea, or the nasal mucosa? The first thing that happens as you begin to smoke is paralysis of the cilia and the trachea. And over time, you will damage those cilia. The good news is when you stop smoking, they're pretty much the first thing to come back. The respiratory membrane is where we actually have the gas exchange occur that's pretty deep in the lungs. The eustachian tube, remember, connects the pharynx to the middle ear so that you can equalize pressure on the eardrum. And the nasal mucosa, really is more protective in terms of trapping bacteria and keeping the nasal passages moist so you can moisten air. All right, let's look at how respiration occurs. Remember, there are four major processes in respiration. Ventilation, external respiration, gas transport, and internal respiration. Let's start by looking at ventilation. Inspiration is when the muscles of your chest cavity correct, co contract. This is going to make your chest cavity get larger because the lungs are kind of stuck to the sides. The lungs will get larger. That's going to increase the volume of the, th of the lungs. And that's going to cause air to be sucked into the lungs. As you make a space bigger, there's less air pressure in it. And air is like any other fluid. It follows a pressure gradient. So air is sucked in. So inspiration is an active process requiring muscular contraction. Expiration is simply what happens when all of the muscles relax. The chest cavity collapses back down to its normal size, and that's going to push air out. So ventilation is simply bringing air in, pushing air out. Now, the Lungs, the muscles between the ribs are called the intercostal muscles, and the diaphragm is that muscle that separates the thoracic from the abdominal cavity. When these all contract, it's going to make the chest cavity larger. The uh, intercostals pull the ribs up a little bit, and the diaphragm pulls down, and that's going to make air brush into the lungs. And you can feel this if you just touch yourself as you're breathing in. Take a deep inhale and you will feel your chest cavity increase in size. Then expiration occurs when all of the inspiratory muscles, the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles all relax and your chest cavity just goes back down to the size it was originally. That's pretty simple. Atelectasis is what we call lung collapse. If your lungs are collapsed, then there's no ventilation. Without ventilation, nothing else can occur, so there's no gas exchange. Your lungs collapse when air enters the pleural space. Part of the feature of this is the fact that that's a closed cavity, so as you change the dimensions of the wall of the chest cavity, the lungs go along for the ride. If you get air in there, that air pushes on the lungs and does not let them follow along. Chest wounds that uh, penetrate the chest cavity will let air from the outside into the thoracic space. The other thing is internal injuries where there's a tear in the visceral pleura or um, that allows air from the lungs to escape into the uh, pleural space. Either of these will cause the lungs to collapse. Air inside the thorax is called pneumothorax.
There are some non-respiratory air movements uh, that modify the normal respiratory rhythm. They still move air, but they're not effectively filling your lungs. One is coughing and sneezing. Both of these are designed to clear your passages. Sneezing typically clears your upper respiratory passages and coughing clears your lower respiratory passages. Laughing and crying are emotional responses. If you think about it, if you've ever laughed so hard that you couldn't get your breath, you're really not moving air per se into your lungs, but you are having air come in and out of your body because you're making sound. And then hiccups and yawns are reflexive. Hiccups occur when your diaphragm is irritated and it starts to spasmodically jump. Usually you have to do something to break that uh, spasm. And nobody's really sure quite what causes yawns. We believe that they're to break up a, a constant respiratory pattern. A lot of times we yawn if we've been sitting still for a long period of time and we think we're about to fall asleep. Our brain knows we shouldn't fall asleep, so in order to break up that slow in and out pattern we've developed while we were sitting still, we yawn to break that pattern. The amount of air we move in and out of our lungs can be measured, and there are several different volumes that we can look at. The tidal volume is the amount of air moving during normal, quiet breathing. Just like the tides at the beach come in and out, pretty much the same all the time, same amount in, same amount out. The air that you breathe in, if you're just sitting still quietly, is pretty much the same. Now in a healthy 25-year-old male, that's about 500 milliliters, and 500 milliliters is right around a pint. Don't worry about memorizing any of these numbers because, as I'll tell you later, this varies from person to person. This is just to give you an idea of what a healthy young person would typically move. Now you have an inspiratory reserve volume. That's the air that you can inspire or breathe in forcefully after a normal tidal inspiration. And that's another over two liters, and a liter is about a quart so another two quarts of air you can you can breathe in and think about it if somebody says okay you're gonna hold your breath you breathe in but you really suck in more air you're you're filling up your inspiratory reserve volume the expiratory reserve volume is the air that you can blow out after a regular expiration and that's about a quart or so of air for most of us uh, this would be when you uh, are blowing out the candles on the birthday cake if you're as old as I am, it takes a long time to get all those candles blown out, so you're really forcing every bit of air out of your lungs you can to get those candles snuffed. The residual volume is the amount of air that remains in your lungs even after you have tried to blow every last bit of it out. That's about uh, another quart, another 1200 milliliters. And we have to keep this air in there because we say it maintains the patency of the alveoli. Now, patency is a word that means they stay open. Remember, you don't want those alveoli to completely close down. You need a little bit of something to keep them puffed just a little bit. Otherwise, every time you try to inhale, it'd be like blowing up all those itty bitty tiny balloons that have a little bit of water in them. It would be very hard to do. We can take the volumes and add them up and come up with what are called respiratory capacities. Now your vital capacity is all of the air you can move if you're breathing as deeply as you can and forcing air out as forcefully as you can. So it's your tidal volume, which is normally what you breathe in and out. Your inspiratory reserve volume, that that you can breathe in if you really try. And your expiratory reserve volume, that that you can breathe out if you really try. We also have what's called dead space volume. Your nose, your trachea, your pharynx, those places have air in them all the time. No matter how hard you breathe in, some of that air never gets to your lungs. So this is your dead space volume. All of these volumes and capacities are gonna vary with the size of the individual, the age and the sex of the individual, and their physical condition. So. That's why I said don't bother to memorize the numbers. If you're ever involved in measuring these in anybody, you'll have charts to look up that will take into account their height and their age and whether they're male or female. All of that has a role in how much, how big these volumes really are.
You've often seen doctors listening to the chest and they're listening for respiratory sounds or breath sounds. Now bronchial sounds are the sounds of air rushing through the trachea and the bronchi. The vesicular breathing sounds are the sounds of air filling the alveoli. And normally this is kind of a soft, muffled little sound, uh, not very dramatic. But there are some sounds that you can hear that indicate pathology. Rails is a rasping kind of sound that occurs. Wheezing is when you hear a whistling sort of sound if you're listening to the lungs, and crackle is if you hear kind of a bubbling sound. And all of these indicate some sort of pathology of the lung. All right, the next thing we need to look at is external respiration. And external respiration is the exchange of gases across the respiratory membrane. And you may be thinking, well, the lungs are kind of deep in the body. How is that external? It's more external than the cells of the body, so that's why it's external respiration. Remember, oxygen and carbon dioxide are lipid soluble, so simple diffusion takes care of this. There is simply more oxygen in the air of the alveolus than there is in the blood. So oxygen crosses across that membrane by diffusion and gets into the blood. There is more carbon dioxide in the blood than in the alveolus. So carbon dioxide is going to diffuse across into the alveolus. Very simple, nothing fancy at all. The oxygen is going to be carried to the cells in the blood. So internal respiration is the exchange of gas between blood and body tissues. Again, simple diffusion and concentrations of oxygen and carbon dioxide take care of this. Since we've just filled up the blood with oxygen in the lungs, there's going to be more oxygen in the blood than the tissues, so oxygen will diffuse across to the tissues. There's going to be more carbon dioxide in the tissues than in the blood, so carbon dioxide from the tissues will enter the blood. So internal and external respiration is based on the concentration of gases so that we know which way they move. You'll remember we had the pulmonary circuit to oxygenate the blood, and the systemic circuit basically delivers the oxygen to the cells. So in the lungs, the blood is high in carbon dioxide, so carbon dioxide diffuses into the alveoli. The alveoli are high in oxygen, so oxygen diffuses into the blood. That's pumped by the heart, the left side of the heart, to the body, the blood has more oxygen, that diffuses to the tissues. The tissues have more CO2, that diffuses to the blood. And that goes back to the right side of the heart so that we can pump to the lungs and reverse the process. So external respiration is the exchange of gases in the lungs. And internal respiration is the exchange of gases in the tissues. If the gases are going to be transported in the blood, we need to talk a little bit about how they're transported. Oxygen primarily attaches to hemoglobin, which is in the red blood cells, and that's how most of it is carried in the uh, blood. Carbon dioxide is a little trickier. Uh, most of the carbon dioxide turns into a bicarbonate ion that stays dissolved in the plasma. There's a little bit that's carried on the hemoglobin, but not very much. So primarily oxygen is carried on the hemoglobin. Carbon dioxide is dissolved in the plasma as bicarbonate ions. Hypoxia is when an inadequate uh, amount of oxygen is delivered to the body tissues. And there can be several reasons. You could have poor blood flow, for example. Um, you could have poor ventilation so that we're not getting oxygen into the lungs appropriately. You could have some sort of metabolic poison attaching to the hemoglobin so that it was unable to pick up oxygen in the blood or deliver it to the tissues. Whenever tissues are not properly oxygenated, no matter what the reason, you get a bluish discoloration in the tissue called cyanosis. This particularly shows up in the nail beds and around the lips. Carbon monoxide is a type of gas poisoning that some people experience if they're in enclosed spaces with uh, motors running of some sort. Uh, uh, this is one thing we worry about people who have kerosene heaters 
because carbon monoxide can be a byproduct of burning kerosene. If those things are not ventilated properly, then carbon monoxide gets in the air and people inhale it. Now, carbon monoxide will attach to hemoglobin 200 times better than oxygen will attach to it. So very small concentrations of carbon monoxide can cause oxygen to not attach to the hemoglobin, but rather carbon monoxide. And this eventually kills people because they don't get oxygen to their tissues. Um, in the case of not enough oxygen getting to tissues, usually the tissue is blue. Carbon monoxide turns the hemoglobin a bright red, so sometimes people who have died of carbon monoxide poisoning look kind of healthy. They, they look kind of pinkish instead of kind of bluish because of the carbon monoxide uh, discoloration of the hemoglobin. All right, how do we control respiration? Well, we have neural mechanisms that help control the rhythm. One of those centers is in the medulla. The respiratory center there is a self-exciting inspiratory center. That is, the cells, there's some cells in the medulla that can discharge, and when they do, they send a signal to all of those inspiratory muscles causing them to contract. And that would be the, they send along the phrenic nerve, which goes to the diaphragm, and the intercostal nerves, which go to those intercostal muscles. Now, this self-excitatory center sends the signal to the muscles to contract. We have to break that communication. So the expiratory center in the medulla actually inhibits the inspiratory center. This breaks the cycle so that the muscles can relax and then the excitatory center excites them again and they contract and then we stop sending the signal and they relax. That's pretty basic. In the pons, which is another part of the brain, there are some respiratory centers that act to kind of smooth out the breathing pattern so that it's kind of instead of just a, an abrupt inhale and then a, a forceful exhale, it's a smoother, more wave-like thing. Eupnea is good breathing, true breathing. So when you're just breathing normally, you have eupnea. Hyperpnea is when you're breathing more deeply. This is what happens when you exercise, for example, you want to move a little more air, so hyperpnea occurs. Besides controlling inhaling and exhaling, we can control the rate and the depth of how we breathe. And these are some of the non-neural factors. For example, when you talk or cough or any of those kinds of things, you don't have a regular inspiratory-expiratory pattern, so you are somehow changing that normal inhale exhale body temperature will also have an effect when you're very warm one of the ways you can lose heat is in your um, air your that comes out of your lungs so you will inhale or exhale more sharply you will breathe more rapidly to move hot air if you're cold you tend to breathe a little more shallowly and a little less frequently because you're trying to conserve your body temperature you do have some control of your breathing. For example, when you sing or you talk, if you're making a speech, you kind of consciously control when you breathe in, when you breathe out, so that you're not taking a breath in the middle of that long thing you have to hold when you're singing. Sometimes little kids will threaten you with holding their breath until they die, and that'll get even with you, won't it? Well, don't worry about it. You can only hold your breath up to a certain point. Carbon dioxide builds up in your blood and that makes you inhale. Have you ever noticed that on the crime scene shows when they fish a body out of the lake, they go, oh, well, he was, he was dead when he hit the water because there's no water in his lungs, or he was alive when he hit the water because he's got water in his lungs. If you are alive and you are underwater, you know that it's water out there and you know you can't breathe it in. And yet, at some point in time, there is an overwhelming reflex for you to inhale. That is why people who are alive when they go into the water will have water in their lungs. They will actually have tried to breathe in water. Not because they wanted to, but because the carbon dioxide buildup in their system forced them to do it. And that's what's gonna happen with children who try to hold their breath. They might pass out, but they won't die. Emotional factors can affect the rate and depth of regulation. Fear, for example, you breathe a little faster when you're afraid. And then chemical factors. 
as I mentioned, that volition, that conscience control cannot go on forever. Carbon dioxide and oxygen levels in the blood will somewhat drive you to, believe, to breathe. Carbon dioxide is the strongest of the two. Oxygen levels usually don't drive breathing very much because you have so much oxygen stored on your hemoglobin. You really have to be air deprived for a while before oxygen levels get low enough to make you breathe. Hypoventilation is that shallow breathing. Hyperventilation is that deep, rapid breathing. And apnea means no breathing. Let's look at some of the diseases of the respiratory system. We'll look at two, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, emphysema, chronic bronchitis will be the two um, COPD diseases we'll look at, and then we'll look at lung cancer. With chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, no matter which one it is, some common factors are almost all of them are smokers, long-term smokers. They all have difficulty breathing. That's what dyspnea means. Because they have damaged some of the protective structures of their respiratory system by smoking, they cough a lot because that's the only way they can bring that mucus up. Their ciliary escalator is not working right. And because they are not effective at bringing up some of the bacteria that get into their system, they tend to have frequent respiratory infections. They have trouble getting enough oxygen to their tissues, so they're somewhat hypoxic. And almost all people with COPD eventually develop respiratory failure. Uh, these people are the people who are walking around with a little green oxygen tank strapped to them when they're out in public because they really just cannot move enough oxygen into their system. Chronic bronchitis is one form of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. People with chronic bronchitis have inhaled irritants that have damaged the mucous membranes and so they, they make extra mucus, so they have this chronic overproduction of mucus. Because mucus acts as a good uh, media for bacteria to grow, they tend to maintain a lot of inflammation of the uh, tissues and they develop scar tissue. Fibrosis is scar tissue, so some of their structures do not uh, function like they should because they've turned, they've gotten fibro fibrotic. Pulmonary infections are quite common. These are people who have influenza, colds, um, all kinds of things six or more times a year. Because the extra mucus tends to block the air passageways, the alveolar, the little bronchioles, they have trouble getting air into their lungs. As a result, they don't get very much oxygen into their blood, and so they're sometimes referred to as blue bloaters because they'll be a little cyanotic. Emphysema is a slightly different disease. Here the alveoli are become enlarged, they get over large, and the damage is done to the alveolar walls. So you have loss of elasticity of the alveolar walls as they become fibrotic. This means that these people have to use their intercostal muscles and their diaphragm to really work their breathing. They don't have that little extra elasticity of the alveoli to puff the air out. They have to do it all with muscles. So they tend to get kind of barrel chested. They're uh, muscles get sort of overdeveloped and their ribs tend to stay pulled out more frequently or, or a little further than a normal person. They can get air into their lungs so they get plenty of oxygen exchange but they have trouble getting it out. These people are sometimes called the pink puffers because they'll look pretty normal but they will be breathing hard all the time using a lot of energy just to move air in and out of their lungs because they don't have the elasticity of the alveoli to help them out. Lung cancer accounts for about one-third of the cancer deaths in the United States. 90% of people with lung cancer are smokers. Smoke initially impairs the respiratory defenses, those cilia, for example, go away. But there are carcinogens in the smoke, and these carcinogens, cancer-producing agents, begin to alter the cells of the lungs and the respiratory system so that they de-differentiate and you start to get tumor cells. Lung cancer can be surgically 
removed, then radiation and chemotherapy can be used to try to prevent the cells that may have left the lung and gone to other places from multiplying there. Some lung cancers are very aggressive and by the time they've been identified as lung cancers, it's almost too late to treat them. The fetus does not have to exchange air with their lungs, so the fetal lungs, or at least the upper part of the fetal respiratory system, has amniotic fluid and mucus in it. The gas exchange is made at the placenta for the fetus, so that the blood from the placenta that comes in the umbilical vein is oxygen rich. But at birth, they have to start using their lungs because once the umbilical cut is cord, cut, cord is cut, they have to um, start exchanging their own gases. So they have to remove the mucus and the fluid from the upper part of the respiratory system and let them take their first breath. Now that first breath is pretty hard to take because none of those alveoli have been blown up yet. So the first one is one of the most um, energy requiring breaths that they will ever take. It takes about two weeks for the lungs to fully inflate so they don't totally do it the first breath. But this is where surfactant is very important. Their alveoli are teeny, teeny, teeny tiny. And without surfactant, they would collapse pretty readily. Now the lungs, because they're some of the you know, last things you really need to have developed in a fetus, don't start producing surfactant about the 20, until about the 28th week of fetal life. This means that premature infants may not be producing surfactant and they have a condition called Infant Respiratory Distress Syndrome. Long ago this was called Highland Membrane Disease. Because they don't have enough surfactant, their lungs collapse after each breath and this makes it hard for them to take each breath. Each breath is just as energy requiring as that first breath because they have to keep reinflating the lungs. Now, today, they can keep these infants alive fairly easily. At one time, this was a very difficult thing. There was not a lot of treatment for this. But we've now developed surfactant, and we can spray that into their lungs, and we can keep them on respirators that will help them keep their lungs inflated so they don't have to work so hard to do it. And again, eventually, their lungs will start producing their own surfactant, and they'll be okay. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic disorder, and it's truly a disorder of the pancreas, but they don't make digestive enzymes, but we can give them digestive enzymes to help them with that. The other thing that happens is they produce this really thick mucus. So all of their mucous membranes produce this extra yucky thick mucus, but in the respiratory system it's particularly a problem. It tends to trap and grow bacteria, so these people have chronic respiratory infections. They typically get colonized with an organism called Pseudomonas aeruginosa, um, which normally doesn't make anybody in the world sick except people like them, and that causes them to have chronic infections. Uh, this bacteria tends to be very drug resistant, so it's very difficult to get rid of it. What they have to do for these people is something called clapping, where they have to kind of beat on their chest two or three times a day to loosen up the mucus so they can get rid of it. They've now developed mucus dissolving drugs, and they do have antibiotics for infection. However, people with cystic fibrosis tend not to live a full life. Uh, somewhere in their late 20s, early 30s, they start having so much difficulty with the infection that they tend to succumb to one. Uh, the only real treatment for this is a lung transplant. Sudden Infant Death Syndrome, SIDS, is probably one of the most tragic of the respiratory problems. This is when an infant stops breathing for unknown reasons. Uh, they have noticed that there is a familial tendency, so if a family loses one child to SIDS, subsequent siblings are monitored at least for the first 18 months to two years of life. Uh, after that time, they seem to not be susceptible to it. They think perhaps the respiratory center in the brain fails or there may be a heart rhythm abnormality that causes this, but they don't really know. The really tragic thing about SIDS is it's one of those things that when an infant dies suddenly, the parents are initially suspected of um, child abuse, of killing the child. So 
not only is there the tragic loss of the child, a child that looked perfectly healthy, but there's that whole suspicion that's cast on the parents for a while until it can be proven that they had nothing to do with it. Asthma is a disease characterized by episodes of coughing and wheezing and difficulty breathing with chest tightness. There are periods of remission where there's no problem. Uh, this is a non-progressive disease. That's why it's not classified as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, it stays about the same. Typically what happens is there's some sort of inflammatory response that's followed by a strong bronchoconstriction so that all of the bronchial tubes close down and you can't get air through them. Typically what triggers this is some sort of allergen that's very common in the home. Dust or dust mites or something like that. Mold, something that's almost impossible to get rid of. As we age, our chest wall becomes more rigid. Some of the cartilage that attach the ribs to the sternum uh, begin to ossify so we don't have as much flexibility at those joints. Uh, the lungs, the alveoli, tend to lose some of those elastic fibers. Remember, loss of elasticity is just kind of a consistent aging problem. Elastic fibers break down and need to be replaced. The older you get, the less efficient you are at replacing those fibers. So they're still breaking down at the same rate, you're just not putting them back at the same rate. Uh, vital capacity tends to decrease. We don't breathe as deeply anymore. We can't hold as much air as we once did. And our sensitivity to increased carbon dioxide levels decreases. That is, we don't, we, we tolerate more carbon dioxide in our blood before we have that drive to inhale. And this means that as we get older, we tend to become hypoxic during sleep. In other words, we don't breathe as often as we should. This can lead to sleep apnea. This is a failure to breathe while sleeping, uh, usually for as long as a minute or two at a time. Uh, you become hypoxic, and this puts a lot of stress on the heart. It is a problem in older people. However, younger people can have it, particularly if they're carrying some extra weight. Uh, you mm -hmm. can do sleep apnea tests, and you can w sleep with a device that will keep you breathing all the time so that that doesn't happen. Exchange of gas between blood and body tissues is called pulmonary ventilation, internal respiration, gas transport, or external respiration. All right, this is the internal respiration. Blood and body tissues is internal. External respiration is between the alveoli and the blood. Gas transport is, of course, how oxygen and carbon dioxide are carried in the blood. And pulmonary ventilation is inhalation and exhalation. A disorder of the respiratory system in which there is enlargement of the alveoli with deterioration of the alveolar walls and fibrosis of the lungs is asthma, cystic fibrosis, emphysema, or chronic bronchitis. If the alveolar walls are the part that is deteriorating, that's emphysema. Chronic bronchitis tends to be that overproduction of mucus that blocks certain passageways. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease. And asthma is, while it's a disorder, it's not a progressive disorder, but rather more like an exaggerated allergy.